Six o'clock. The six o'clock. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you to be here for the tenth Asian N webinar today, and we have our very distinguished speakers from Japan, Professor Takashi Kawahara, and as there are a few nurses from the US and Canada, Miss Pamela, Miss Dola, Miss Christine Wong, and Miss Vinasa Acheni. Uh, they are the nursing, they will talk on the nursing uh, aspect. And our chair for today is Professor Takaki Kiyashi, Professor yeah. Sabora Sagalata, and our moderators, Dr. Shahido Rahman and Dr. Kathy. So uh, without further ado, can I call upon Professor Yoko Kato to give us a few words? Hi, welcome, Baba. So good evening. Uh, maybe uh, good morning or good afternoon uh, to everybody. Thank you very much for joining our TENS uh, SN webinar. We all, always are looking forward to uh, nursing uh, advancements uh, uh, from your lectures. Uh, today, uh, main tema may be uh, acidic uh, hydrocephals. Itakagi Sensei, uh, who will be the chair of this, uh, the today's session, uh, he is expert uh, uh, NPH, and also Kawahara Sensei is a uh, very high skill for the treatment of the uh, NPH. So uh, we are very much looking forward. And the, uh, another nurse uh, lectures, we all uh, expecting your talk. Thank you very much. So Thank any, you, please? Prof. Kato. Uh, I would like to call upon Shani to be uh, the moderator for, for this webinar. Shani, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, all of you. Already the introduction for the webinar is over. Anyway, and I, I would like to say welcome uh, once again, uh, Professor Yoko Kato, President ACNS, Matron E, President ACNN, Professor Takagi Kiyoshi, and Professor Dabora Snegalata, session chairs, our invited speakers, commentators, and dear participants. A warm greetings from ACNN. I welcome all of you to this 10th ACNN webinar on <coughs> normal pressure hydrocephalus. We can move on the session directly. The scheme of today's webinar will be, as already discussed, we'll be having an initial talk by Professor Tata Shi Kawahara on normal pressure hydrocephalus, followed by a discussion led by Dr. Muhammad uh, Shahidu Rahman and Dr. Kathy Karbit. Um, the entire session will be chaired by Professor Takagi Kiyoshi. After his closing remark, we'll be having nursing session chaired by Professor Dabora Snehalida and Ms. Palm Sharma. Um, will be presenting the management of hydrocephalus, highlighting the nursing perspectives, followed by we'll be having a demonstration of uh, caring uh, patients with normal pressure hydrocephalus through two case studies by Ms. Donna. And further, one more case study will be discussed by Catherine and Vanessa. Catherine, Venice, and Christian Wong. After comments and closing remarks, uh, the session will be um, ending. And to introduce the topic, Normal pressure hydrocephalus um, is often uh, seen in the practice of neurosurgery. It has occurred gradually following cerebral hemorrhage, meningitis, or brain surgeries. The fact that the clinical presentation mimics many of the other diseases, which make it difficult to diagnose. But one diagnose, the management is there, which gives symptom reduction in approximately um, half of the cases. I have, in fact, read uh, the, one of the paper of uh, Professor Takagi Kiyoshi, the director of NPS Center of Abiko Sejinkai Hospital of Japan. I, in fact, um, I have read a uh, paper on NPH in the management and its outcome after shunt surgery. Uh, the low response to treatment may be attributed to the possibility of other ongoing degenerative diseases, which could not be altered by CSF diversion procedures alone. So I was quite impressed by that paper. And we've got an uh, apt person to uh, chair the session. I welcome uh, Professor Takagi Kyoshi to chair the session. Up to you, sir. 
Okay, uh, I will introduce Professor uh, Takashi Kawahara uh, to start his lecture. He's uh, a specialist in the NPH field, and uh, he is a very special for the lumboperitoneal shunt under local anesthesia, and he had uh, uh, over 800 cases, and uh, he has very good new idea for the uh, development of uh, INPH. So, uh, so uh, it is very important to hear his lecture. Okay? Okay. Thank you we'll for your, your lecture. Thank you for your introduction for me. I will share uh, my slide. ちょっと もう一回やり直しましょうか。ちょっと待ち can you press the flask shaped button on the bottom of your If you don't part? mind, please uh, え、トライアゲン。いや。え、プリーズ、プリーズ。今日、え、で。サイモン。イエス。カタカタ。サイモン。はい、はい。アンベルプロフェッサー。アンベルプロフェッサー。オッケー。ナイス、ナイス、ナ
今どうでしょうか、okay. まあまあまあまあ、まあ、<笑>一応見えますけどもうちょっと小さいですか、うん okay. 小さいですね小さいですか、uh, Raja say, how is it? Yeah, it's okay better than earlier Yes, it's okay 小さいですけどねはい大丈夫じゃないですけどまあまあまあ高井先生読めますああ、ウィキャン、ああ、ウィキャン、シー、ああ、シーズン、ああ、キャラクターズ、ああ、ピクチャーズ、ああ、ウィキャン、ああ、リスン、トゥ、カワハラツ、ボイス、ウィル、ソウ、ああ、サーツ、ディスワン、ああ、ディスライド、ああ、スモール、ビティナフ。ビティナフじゃあ、スタート、スタートしましょう。Okay. はい、ああ、オッケー、スタート。ああ、I'm sorry. And, uh, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, uh, Hello, everyone. It's good to see you today. I'm Takashi Kawahara. It's a great honor to be able to speak to you. Before I start, I'd like to thank Professor Yoko Kato and Professor Ichen for giving me to this,、uh, this opportunity. The title of my presentation is Clinical Approach for the Patient of Idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus and cerebral spinal fluid dynamics as revealed by thoracic spinal MRI. My hometown, Kawashima City, is south of Japan, and Kawashima City is famous for its active volcano, Sakurajima Island.、Um, my talk is Divided into five parts. First, I'll talk about INPH, history, clinical findings, and treatment. Second, I'll talk about rumbo peritoneal shunt for the treatment of INPH. Third, over drainage after LP shunt and its management. Next, I'd share our new idea about CSF dynamics and the pathogenesis of INPH. Finally, I'd share about our post operative management of INPH. Okay, I'll talk about INPH. INPH was first reported in 1965 by Dr. Adams and Dr. Hakim. Some elderly patients with dementia, gait disturbance, and urinary incontinence had enlarged ventricles despite normal CSF pressure. CSF shunt surgery improved their symptoms. More than 50 years later, The etiology of this disease is still unknown. Symptoms of INPH, INPH are dementia, gait disturbance, and urinary incontinence, sometimes described as the triad of symptoms. These symptoms occur in older age. And are slowly progressive. The most characteristic symptom of this disease is gait disturbance. The center shows the normal pattern of the gait. On the right is small step gait of Parkinson's disease, and on the left, Is the gate of INPH patient. INPH patient has a small step gate, magnetic gate, and broad based gate. And the patient also falls easily. Another symptom of INPH is. Dementia. Its characteristic feature is a slowing of psychomotor speed. 
the patient's thinking becomes slower and less energetic. Another symptom is disturbance of urinary function. The frequency of urination is increased and patient go to the bathroom every few hours during the daytime and four to five times at night and sometimes fail to make it in time. This is a condition called overactive bladder. This is a MR image of the normal brain. The black space in the middle are the ventricle, where CSF accumulate. The black stripes on the surface of the brain are the cerebral sulcus. The largest temporal sulcus is called the Sylvian fissure. This is the MR image of INPH patient. It looks like brain atrophy, but it has certain specific features. Blue arrows shows the enlarged ventricles. Red circles indicate the narrowing of the high convexity and the median sulcus. Red arrows shows the enlargement of the Sylvian fissure. Yellow arrows are the enlargement of focal cerebral sulcus. These four characteristic findings are called disproportionately enlarged subarachnoid space hydrocephalus or DESH dash for short. And next, the patient with characteristic imaging, a tap test is performed. Usually, we remove 30 to 50 milliliter CSF or remove it until CSS pressure 0 centimeter H2O. Currently, three types of surgery are performed on patients with INPH. Ventricular peritoneal shunt VP shunt. Ventricular arterial shunt VA shunt and rumbo peritoneal shunt, LP shunt. The process of diagnosing INPH is illustrated as an algorithm. Taken from the third edition's Japanese guideline 2021 and CSF shunt intervention is effective for treating INPH. <clears throat> there is no medication for INPH with evidence. Rehabilitation for INPH is not commonly performed in our country. Only the CSF shunt surgery is reasonable for INPH patient. Next, I'll talk about LP shunt for INPH patients. This is a post-operative 3D CT after LP shunt surgery. 
you can see Kahta from Rumbar to abdomen. Our LP shunt procedure can be seen on this website, YouTube website. This video has been viewed over 10,000 times. The research group of the Normal Pressure Hydrocephalus Society of Japan proved the good effect of LP shunt on INPH in the Multi Center Prospective Clinical Study, Symphony 2. <clears throat> My technical note is cited in this paper. This is one of the figures in this paper. Three months after LP shunt treatment, LP shunted group more improved than the conservative treatment group. After that symphony study, 55% of INPH patients are treated with LP shunt surgery in Japan. But LP shunt had the disadvantage of high frequency of post operative minor complications. <clears throat> At the period of, the, of this Symphony 2 study, the most common complications that required the operation was subcutaneous migration of the abdominal caster from the peritoneal cavity. On the left is X-ray of the abdominal caster migration. Con coiling is the migration sign. On the right is the CT scan of this complication. The caster migrated, mig sorry, the caster migrates to the subcutaneous space. We invented the simple method to prevent this migration. It is very simple technique. We call this technique penetrating pectoral muscle method. In this method, the abdominal caster is not exposed in the surgical space. After this complication is resolved, sorry, after this complication is resolved, the most common and serious complication at present is the over drainage. Next, I'll talk about the over drainage after LP shunt and its management. This is a typical findings of over drainage after LP shunt surgery. Orthostatic headache occurs with decreased CSF volume. In the Symphony 2 study, total events of minor and serious 
over drainages are approximately 30% after LP shunt. CT and MRI sometimes reveals subdural effusion or subdural hematoma. This is an abdominal X-ray of the patient immediately after LP shunt surgery. To avoid this complication, a programmable valve placed in the course of the system. This is one of the shunt valve we use in LP shunt surgery. It consists of three parts, reservoir, programmable valve, and anti-siphon system. This valve has eight levels of opening pressure to regulate the flow of CSF. And this valve can be set to the highest pressure over the 40 centimeter H2O. The programmable valve is placed in the shunt system. This flow chart is our management of over drainage after LP shunt surgery. Initial valve pressure is highest setting. And one week after surgery, when the patient has no over drainage symptoms, we will decrease the valve setting. When the over drainage appear under highest setting, patient should be bed rest as soon as possible. When the over drainage symptoms show improvement, the programmable valve will be gradually set lower. And we recommend the additional tandem valve method when the over drainage would not be reduced despite the highest setting. This is an intraoperative picture of the tandem valve method. A skin incision is made in the flank. The abdominal catheter is transected once, and an additional valve is connected in tandem. The gravity valve is placed vertically to the catheter. It is a post-operative X-ray. With this additional tandem valve method, over drainage has been resolved in all cases so far. It is easy to diagnose of over drainage with the CT findings of ventricular narrowing and subdural hematoma. But when there are little intracranial change, the patient is forced to bed rest for a long time. By the way, how long should we keep patients bed rest? And when should we decide? to do the additional tandem valve method.
we reported the unique MRI findings in two disorder, spontaneous intracranial hypotension and over drainage after LP shunt. Normally, spinal cord exists in the middle of the canal, like this. And we can see Patterson's venous plexus in the spinal epidural space, as indicated by the red arrow. But this venous plexus cannot see in the spinal MRI normally. This is a thoracic spinal MRI in SIH and over drainage cases. In this image, we can see typical findings. First, white arrow, anterior deviation of the spinal cord, and the blue arrowhead, anterior shift of the dorsal dura mater of spin spinal dural sac. And we can see venous dilation of the epidural space as shown by the red arrows. We named these findings dural sac shrinkage signs, or DSSS for short. These findings is very useful in diagnosing over drainage after LP shunt surgery. Next, I, sh I would share our new ideas about uh, CSF dynamics and the pathogenesis of INPH. Elderly people with MRI findings of INPH are about 1%. And as people become older, the number of patients presenting with INPH gradually increases. From our previous research, we realized that the spinal dural sac is swelling and shrinking with the CSF pulsation with brain beat from heart movement. And we additionally noticed that the structure of the spinal canal buffers the pulsation of the CSF, like this movement. This is a simple illustration of the mechanism which buffers the CSS pulsation. This idea is accepted and will be reported in a medical journal near future. And the generation of the spinal canal reduces the buffering function 
pulsation of CSF enlarge the ventricle and sulci, resulting in hydrocephalus. My knowledge of high school physics helps me understanding the pathogenesis of hydrocephalus. Elderly patients often present with spinal degenerations. For example, spongylosis, cervical disc disease, and compression fracture. Therefore, it is considered that the incidence of INPH increases in older people. Finally, I'd like to talk about our post-operative management of INPH patient. The patient needs to visit the clinic in order to check the post-operative conditions. After one month, three months, six months, one year. After that, we recommend that patient visit the clinic every six months. We check the subdural hematoma, abdominal cut migration, and adjust the shunt valve setting for proper CSF flow. After the surgery, patients shouldn't be lazy. If patients stay in bed all the time, CSF will not flow through the cutter. It is important that patients do the rehabilitation provided by the long-term care insurance service. Patient and their families already have some problems in their daily life before treatment. Therefore, only the diagnosing and the treating disease are not enough. It is necessary to work together with family, doctors, nurses, care managers, care staffs to provide safe and secure treatment and nursing care. This is my suggestions for neurosurgical staff. The Asian countries are expected to have an increasingly, sorry, the Asian countries are expected to have an increasing elderly population in the future. The opportunities for CSF shunt surgery and neurosurgical care for INPH patients are more and more necessary in the future. And this is a conclusion slide. LP shunt is minimum invasive procedure for INPH treatment. Post-operative over-drainage is the most serious complication and it might be solved by additional tandem valve method. We found the characteristic findings DSSS in thoracic spinal MRI for over-drainage diagnosis. 
we proposed that the spinal canal buffers CSF pulsation and its reduction might be the etiology of INPH. Neurosurgical treatment and care for INPH patient would be more and more necessary in the future. If you have a chance to come to Japan, please visit Kagoshima Prefecture and see Sakurajima Island. But active volcano Sakurajima Island explodes about 100 times a year. So we want proper valve for this active volcano. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kawahara. Uh, it is a very nice lecture, and uh, uh, you said a very new idea for the pathogenesis of idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, uh, you mentioned about the importance of uh, epidural space, uh, epidural, uh, uh, the importance of spinal cord and spinal uh, CSF. And uh, uh, as I understand quite uh, well, uh, all the patients uh, have uh, some spinal disease, uh, spondylosis or uh, herniated disc, uh, and it may cause uh, uh, high incidence of idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. Is it right? Yes. Uh... We uh, check the uh, number of patients and uh, uh, brain dog, dog patient. Uh, we compared uh, oh. both patients. Uh, and uh, uh, INPH patients uh, is uh, narrow. Cervical canal, cervical mm -hmm. canal stenosis, and uh, a traffic canal stenosis, and uh, number of uh, disc cervical disc disease is more than uh, brain dog patient. We reported, uh, oh. we already reported medical uh, journal. Mm -hmm. It published uh, um, a few months later. That is very good. And uh, I, I'd like to know how long uh, does it take for you to uh, complete one surgery, uh, operation time, uh, meantime? Uh, operation time. Operation L -patient. time. Help patient for help patient. Uh, about uh, uh, 30 or 40 minutes. Oh, it's for very one short. Patient. Uh, are there any questions or comments uh, for this nice lecture? Um, thank you, Professor, uh, for your nice presentation. It's an excellent demonstration. Uh, I just I just want to know uh, why we put the abdominal end of the catheter in the greater sac or in the lesser sac? Hmm? Uh, sorry. Uh, why? Ab abdominal caster. Uh, you 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 talked about abdominal caster. Abdominal catheter, right? Why do you put the abdominal catheter in the lesser? Sick or in the greater sick? I mean, peritoneal cavity. Uh, you put it behind the uh, transverse colon or just in the abdominal cavity? Uh, Douglas Poch. Yeah. Uh, Douglas Poch. Uh, 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 u
apa namanya kastar chief is yeah but location coach. position 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 not in direction position of the kasita hmm. yes yes i do put it just in the peritoneal cavity or the lesser sac of the peritoneal cavity i mean behind the stomach or in front of the stomach ah uh, lesser sac uh, or greater sac we, I mean, we, we, we don't care about the uh, po position of the cutter and uh, we 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 penetrate the rectal muscle obliquely so the uh, tip of uh, abdomen cutter directed to uh, Douglas porch about okay. 90% nine, of the patient after every patient uh, abdominal abdominal cutter uh, pressed uh, to the uh, Douglas porch okay okay arigato arigato Do you have any comment? Uh, well, uh, Professor Kawahara, I would like to yeah. know the change of body weight uh, after surgery. Uh, in my patient, uh, very extreme changes, uh, uh, about to 10 kilogram uh, just after one year. Uh, do you have any kind of this change? in UL patient, and it is very important for uh, the pressure setting, I think. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kakagi. I, 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 <clears throat> I think so. Uh, body weight, uh, if a patient increase body weight, uh, CSF flow through casta, is uh, decreased uh, so we have to uh, change the um, valve setting uh, in the uh, during the clinic clinic uh, i think uh, i know dr takagi uh, operate uh, nph patient with uh, ventricular arterial shunt I think uh, the patient is uh, uh, very uh, effective uh, therapy because uh, it is no relation to body patient's body weight. And uh, our research is uh, uh, INPH patients uh, uh, has cervical this uh, many INPH patient has cervical disease, so a patient uh, will be less effective in the future. So when the patient is not so old, we recommend the uh, shunt, shunt. Okay. You, you mean that about 60 or 65 years old patient, you recommend VA shunt and older patient? Yeah, 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 older yeah. yeah, yeah. Older patient is not, is okay. Because a uh, patient is uh, less, uh, invasive surgery uh, and uh, it uh, could be op op operated under local anesthesia. Uh, so patient uh, improve symptoms for uh, several years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you have any uh, questions or uh, a proposal, uh, I would like to close this session, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tagagi, for chairing the first session. Now we are moving on to the next session where the 
a nursing part will be covered. I invite uh, Professor Dabora to chair the second session. Uh, greetings from Christian Medical College, Velour, India. Uh, am I audible? Yes. yes. All right. um, thank you for thanks, uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be part of this um, ACNN webinar. Uh, at this time, for the first session on hydrocephalus, the nursing perspective, uh, may I invite uh, Madam Pamela Sharma? Madam is a clinical nurse educator in the Vancouver General Hospital. Uh, it's our privilege to hear from you, uh, Madam Pamela, over to you. Thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen. Is that visible? Yes, okay. All right, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Yes, I'm a clinical nurse educator at Vancouver General Hospital's Neurosciences Department. I am a career neuro nurse and a member of the Canadian Association of Neuroscience Nurses. Uh, today, I'll be presenting a case study on normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, I have no disclosures related to this presentation. I'll start by thanking Professor Kawahara for his presentation on NPH. For the purpose of my presentation, I'm just gonna review some of the core concepts again. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is an adult onset disease seen primarily in the elderly population. Diagnosis includes uh, obtaining a thorough history looking for exclusion criteria and presence of one or more of the following triad, gait disturbances, cognitive decline, or urinary incontinence. There's also diagnostic imaging that is completed, a CT scan and or a primary or an MRI, and then a CSF drainage trial. Um, should there be an accurate diagnosis of NPH, the standard gold, the gold standard for treatment still remains the V patient at our center. I'd like to introduce you to Jane. She is an 81 year old Caucasian female she was referred to the hydrocephalus clinic due to a several year history of progressive gait decline. She brought her husband and daughter with her to the appointment as she has difficulty remembering her timeline of symptoms. Jane did suffer a fall back in 2020 and has since been using either a cane or a walker over the last two years. Her past medical history includes osteoarthritis in both knees and a fracture to her right foot, which occurred a few years prior. She also has hypertension and a B12 deficiency. Jane does experience pain as a result of her previous fracture and osteoarthritis, but her pain is reasonably well controlled. Over the last couple of years, Jane's mobility has decreased to the point that she now has a shuffling gait and experiences episodes of freezing. Jane is usually pushed while seated in her walker um, and she is only able to walk very short distances. In addition, she has significant bladder incontinence and nocturia. She also reports a significant cognitive decline. Jane's initial assessment was completed by her local internal medicine physician. He did suspect NPH, but he could not support her with the CSF trial. And it is for this reason that her care was transferred to our center. Based on her initial symptoms, Jane's primary physician had sent her for a CT scan in July of 2022. Um, and this scan revealed ventriculomegaly. Jane chose to expedite her own MRI by paying for a private scan while she waited for her referral for the hydrocephalus clinic. This occurred in February of 2023. She was able to visit the clinic in July of this year where we obtained a thorough history and conducted a cognitive screening, which demonstrated short-term and moderate-term memory was being affected. Um, they also preferred, performed a primary gait assessment, which involved a 10-meter walk down a hallway. This was conducted three times. During her initial 10-meter walk, um, she took a minute and 29 seconds to complete the course without the use of a cane. 
During the second trial, her 10 meter um, course took her three minutes and 59 seconds and 177 steps to complete. Her final trial required her to use her cane. Um, this prompted the provider to rebook Jane for a um, large volume lumbar puncture the following week. When she came back, uh, we repeated the 10 meter gait trial. Once this was completed, the provider performed a lumbar puncture to remove 40 mils of CSF. Jane experienced uh, low pressure headache as a result of the CSF removal. She also experienced some nausea and vomiting. She was given the appropriate time to rest. And after this, we repeated the gait assessment. Her results, Jane had significant improvement of symptoms as a result of the removal of CSF. With this improvement in her gait, she was able to cut down the time it took to walk the 10 meters by 76%. She also had a 70% increase in her stride length. And although she used the cane, the provider felt that she could have completed the course without the use of an assistive device. Based on these findings, the decision was made to recommend a VP shunt insertion as we felt that this would greatly improve the quality of life for this patient. Jane came in for her procedure in September and had a right VP shunt insertion performed. The codman insertus shunt was originally set to four during the procedure. Jane tolerated the procedure quite well and began mobilizing within 24 hours. Her care was trans, uh, transferred from the neuro ICU to regular ward bed. Once cleared by physio and occupational therapy, she was discharged home with a total length of stay of three days. During her admission, nursing assessment included the completion of a thorough neurovitals assessment, assessment of the surgical sites, head and abdomen. She had a VP shunt inserted, and so there is a risk for peritonitis to develop as a peritoneal response to a foreign object. And so nurses are obligated to assess the abdomen for pain, tenderness, and warmth over the shunt tubing site. We offer her pain management and proper head positioning. Uh, to optimize CSF drainage, we typically elevate the head of the bed to 30 degrees, regardless of the fact that the shunt will drain as programmed. There is administration of postoperative antibiotic, and we continue to monitor for increased ICP should the shunt malfunction. Uh, Post-discharge, Jane was seen back in the hydrocephalus clinics four weeks later. Um, she had significant improvement in gait and almost complete resolution of her preoperative incontinence. She did, however, report mild nausea and motion sickness while driving. And for this reason, the provider adjusted her shunt setting to five. Her CT scan also showed a slight subdural hygroma consistent with overdrainage. A repeat CT was ordered and she'll be back in the clinic in another few weeks. So Jane experienced really good outcomes as a result of her assessment findings and her treatment. So why would I show you a case study with such great outcomes? Because there's still one problem. And the problem lies at the beginning of the case study. It lies with the identification of this diagnosis. So prevalence of this diagnosis uh, ranges depending on the literature, um, roughly 1.5 to 3.7%. And the results are dependent on the type of guideline that is used for diagnosis. Um, there's the Japanese guideline versus the American European guideline. A Swedish study recently found that 80 year old patients with NPH uh, were four times, of the 80 year old population, four times more likely to have NPH than the younger 70 year old population. The common theme recurrent in all of the research papers is that the prevalence of idiopathic NPH is probably higher than what is actually being reported. The surgical rates, however, are still even lower than the reported study finding. So what are some barriers for diagnoses? 
Barriers are that the symptoms initially resemble conditions that are otherwise prevalent within this age population. There's also a couple criteria and guidelines present which may create confusion on accurate diagnoses. And diagnostic imaging and CSF trials provide a lot of supporting data for NPH diagnoses, but there could be delays or accessibility issues which can prevent a timely diagnosis. There's also lack of education within the community regarding normal pressure hydrocephalus. Things to consider going forward. Um, as I mentioned in my case study, Jane paid for her own MRI, which helps her outcome, but this isn't necessarily an option for everyone and accessibility matters. Education also matters because the more awareness that is created regarding this diagnosis, the faster that we can implement treatments. During my research, I did come across an American website for Alzheimer's Society, and they actually had a page dedicated to NPH. At the end of the day, the earlier that we can correctly identify idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus patients, the sooner that we can surgically intervene. And the hope is that we can increase good outcomes and improve the lives of more patients. An added bonus of this is that correctly diagnosing and treating patients creates less of a burden over the healthcare system in the long term. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Madam Panila. Thank you. That was a very uh, uh, brief, but a very uh, nice presentation of your case study. Uh, we will keep the questions for the end. May I now uh, invite uh, Ms. Madam Dona Catherine Vallis. Uh, Madam will be presenting two case studies uh, demonstrating nurses interven intervening to provide care for ill children with hydrocephalus. Uh, Madam Dona Catherine Vallis is a nurse practitioner for the past eight years, and she works in Pardon Children's Medical Center of Neurosurgery. I think her passion is towards pediatric um, uh, patients with neurosurgical illness. May I invite Dona Catherine Madden to present her case study? Thank you, everybody. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. No? Yes, we can see. No, no, not, not yet. Not yet. Can you tell me what you see, please? We just see your face, Donna. No. <laughs> So on my screen, I see my talk and you don't see my talk? Only your face. Darn it. I'm not gonna keep you if I, if I run into glitches here, I'm gonna just go ahead and verbally run through it. I am so very sorry. Donna, have you shared your screen at the bottom, on the bottom bar? I see arrows, I see a magnifying glass. There's a, sh there's a share screen icon at the bottom. Use presenter view and screen. Black screen, white screen, use presenter view. Do you see the slides now? No, no. the toolbar at the bottom has, Donna, the toolbar at yep. the bottom has mute, stop video, and just go all the way across. And there's a little box with an arrow in it that says share. So you just click on that arrow. I'm so sorry I did that. And now my screen is, let's see, to use slideshow. If you're using so two screens, have... it over. Yeah, what I see is arrow, pencil, um, magnifying glass, CC, video, dots, and then another arrow for the talk. And then if I click on the arrow, it says next previous title, use presenter view, pointer options, keep slides updated and show. 
So on my screen, it shows that I'm in the, in the talk. Rather than hold you, may I just run through it verbally? That's not nearly as fun. Ma'am, if you know in the email ID of any one of us, please share the PPT so that we can share from our side. Preferably Professor Kathy or... Hmm. Yeah, I'm in my PowerPoint slide and it shows it on my desktop. Say again, madam, what would you like me to do? May I run through it verbally or would you like to go ahead and have a different presenter? Notes, comments. Mason, uh, e, you are uh, muted. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, can the next presenter present okay. first? Absolutely, thank you for your understanding and I apologize for holding. Yeah. And uh, Ola, can you uh, try to email the, the slide to, to me or to Dr. Kathy? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, the next presenter. Uh, Madam, can I introduce? Sure. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, we are going to have a case study presentations again on normal hydrocephalus. Uh, this is going to be by two uh, madams. One is uh, Vanessa Cherney. Madam is a nurse practitioner in the neuro-oncology, Toronto Western Hospital Division of Neurosurgery. And she has her expertise in neuro-nursing uh, department. The second presenter will be Madam Christine Wong. Madam is a nurse practitioner in the Crenville. Kremble Brain Institute Division of Neurosurgery of the Toronto Western Hospital. Um, we are privileged uh, to hear from both of you for your case study presentation. Over to Madam Vanisa. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, before I begin, my colleague Christine tells me that she can't talk. I don't think she has access to talk, and I was wondering if someone could grant her that. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh. Yeah, my, so Christine doesn't have an option to unmute herself. I'm wondering, did she have panelist access or? I think she's still in the attendees. She's in the panelist group already. She is? Yeah, I can see her in the screen of panelists. Yeah, she's connecting. Oh. Okay, she's rejoining. Hello, good morning. Sorry, <laughs> didn't have the proper access. Um, how's everyone? Um, I'm going to have um, everyone, sorry, it's the morning of for us it's morning of um, technical difficulties. So I'm gonna ask Vanessa to uh, share the slides and then, um, uh, um, and then we'll, we'll get started. So while she's doing that, I'll just introduce ourselves really quickly. Uh, Vanessa and I are nurse practitioners at Toronto Western Hospital, which is one of the largest uh, regional neurosurgery centers uh, in Canada and um, for those that are not familiar with nurse practitioner roles, we um, sort of um, function like physicians. I guess we work within a neurosurgery team with uh, staff surgeons where we uh, collaborate with them and the residents to uh, essentially provide cares for, care for our patients and obviously work with the nursing team to uh, facilitate a, a good care plan. Um, but uh, a lot of the interventions that uh, that's been discussed by the doctor as well as Pamela, we sort of sit right somewhere in between that. Um, it's a somewhat special role within North America. So uh, we hope to give you some of that privilege, uh, some of that like, perspective, sorry, um, as to how we function within our team. 
You see the slides? Yep. Okay. So um, we uh, are going to go over the case study for uh, Miss Mary. Um, she, I'll just dive right into it. Uh, she is a 73-year-old uh, um, right-handed woman who has a past medical history of anxiety only and takes uh, some risperidone and Zoloft as her home medications. Um, and she presented with some uh, unsteady gait and very difficult time walking and with some cognitive changes uh, such as memory impairment, confusion, acting quite bizarre as per her um, husband. And she's also newly developed urinary incontinence over the last four months. And uh, these symptoms have gone much worse over the last two months. And uh, that's uh, worsened by uh, multiple falls. And how she eventually ended up with us is that um, she had a fall and um, onto her uh, right uh, side and had some pain and bruising to her shoulder and her wrist. So as a part of her workup, um, you know, her vital signs, um, her blood pressure is normal. She's a bit tachycardic. Uh, she's afebrile. She has increased rest rate and um, her oxygen saturation is okay. Um, she's GCS 14 as in she's confused, um, but she opens her eyes spontaneously and follows commands. Uh, she, but she's asking repetitive questions. She has a lot of difficulty following the conversation. Her gait, when we're walking, she's slow, uh, shuffling her gait, her feet is dragging, and she's having a lot, a lot of pain um, to her right shoulder and arm. Uh, but her pulses are present and uh, good color sensation and movement. Um, her blood work is unremarkable. Uh, diagnostic imaging shows that she did, unfortunately, have a right humerus fracture and a right radius fracture. Given that she uh, has some neurological changes, we decided to do a CT of the brain. And her CT shows this, which is uh, a moderately dilated lateral and third and, moderate, uh, and mildly dilated fourth ventricle uh, with no uh, lesion or vascular malformation that we can see. And this is very consistent with ventricular uh, megaly. Um, so in terms of consultations, we uh, consulted the orthopedic team for fracture management. Uh, we also uh, have the um, resources and privilege of having a geriatric team with us as well, whom uh, we consulted to um, determine um, whether or not it's delirium or dementia. I guess from the family, they really thought that, you know, given her age that she was progressing due to likely sort of old age dementia um, and thought this was all sort of normal process of aging. Um, and then we also um, spoke with our neurology team as well because of the, um, of some of the signs and symptoms that are leading up to our diagnosis of NPH as well as the uh, CT scan as well. That shows the enlargement of the ventricles. So when we're talking about the MPH diagnosis, um, there's, there's definitely criteria, uh, one of them being that there's brain imaging that shows uh, normal um, hydrocephalus. And the brain tissue may actually appear shrunken even though the ventricles are enlarged. And then there's the clinical criteria, which is very important. Um, there's the MPH triad, which includes the gait disturbance, the cognitive impairment, as well as urinary dysfunction um, as well. And then one of the things that obviously we were needed for the diagnosis is a cerebral spinal fluid tests. Um, some people call it a tap test. Some people call it a large volume lumbar puncture, which consists of um, withdrawing 40 to 50 milliliters of CSF at one time um, to um, assess for function afterwards. We often do CSF outflow resistance um, and measure opening pressures as well that will um, largely help with predicting uh, shunt res uh, responsiveness and or determine shunt pressures. Um, and so with the CSF tap test, also known as large volume lumbar puncture, it's the most widely used prognostic test to assess candidacy for shunt placement and shunt responsiveness. Um, 
so uh, a positive tap test response has been shown to have a good positive predictive value of response. Um, but failure to respond to tab test does not necessarily mm. uh, indicate that a shunt is not needed or that the diagnosis is of MPH does not exist or is not true. Um, it largely has to do with the fact that tab test has a, a high false negative rate, uh, likely owing to the subtlety of determining of the post tap changes and the subjective and objective findings that we um, often measure afterwards. Now, one of the things that we have to think about. Um, Actually, um, we can go to the next slides. So the um, there's been a lot of articles that talk about that the if we look at the triad for um, normal pressure hydrocephalus, uh, we talk about the gait, we talk about the cognition, we talk about the incontinence. Now the tap test really is most sensitive and specific to um, like the gait. Uh, perspective of it. Uh, you may not necessarily after the tap test or the shunt see a drastic improvement in the cognition or the uh, incontinence piece, but we really should see a significant improvement of the gait. And so um, we found this article which um, essentially says that the classic features of gait often used to determine diagnosis of NPH. Um, these are, include um, things like a wide base stride, reduced foot floor clearance and small steps. Um, and so, sorry, those are the things that are not, not so sensitive and specific, but things like walking speed, steps of turning and tendency towards falling were the most likely to improve post tap tests. And these should be measured uh, specifically after a tap test to, to determine the shunt candidacy and whether or not someone should get a VP shunt. I'll turn it over to Vanessa to talk a little bit more about the um, diagnostic, uh, subjective, and objective uh, assessment for um, the post tap test. Thanks, Christine. So, as part of the uh, referrals, as Christine mentioned, we would make a referral for these patients to uh, a neurologist, a neurology team as well. Um, and they will test many components of, uh, they will perform many different tests uh, on these patients. And so, you know, as Christine had mentioned, a large, uh, the main component of the triad um, that we see in changes with, with regards to the TAP test is with regards to their gait. Um, and so there are many different tools that you can use to assess one's gait. Um, one that we see is the, the, you need, need to make sure you do a comprehensive gait assessment. And one of the scales is the gait scale, um, which as shown here has three different steps. There's the walking score, um, which as shown on the table to the right has many different, um, features. I won't list them all, but they're here. So, uh, disturbed turning wide, best wide base stride. Um, reduced foot clearance, tendency towards falling. Um, and then the other component is the step score. So how many steps it takes for a 10 meter walk. And then the last component is the time score. Uh, so the amount of time it's required to walk 10 meters. Other components of the neurology assessment, of course, also involves cognition. Um, there are many cognitive tests that one could use, but one that we see quite often is the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment um, test. This is a test of cognitive function. Um, it is used for many neurological conditions, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, brain tumors, um, and also um, NPH. This tests um, many functions, executive and visu visual spatial, naming, attention, language. Um, it's scored out of 30. So the higher your score, the better your cognition. Um, and so for Miss Mary, for our patient, these were her scores. So with regards to the, the gate scale, which I talked about on the previous um, page, you can see that before her uh, tap test, lumbar puncture, whatever you want to call it, um, her scores were much higher, which is not good in this instance. And then following the TAP test, her scores seem to have improved. Um, the total gate score before the TAP test was 27 and her post TAP test score was 14. And the areas where she really improved on following the lumbar puncture was her um, turning, uh, her wide base stride was not as wide um, and she did not have a tendency towards falling. 
Uh, you can see the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test I talked about. Her cognition uh, score before the lumbar puncture was a 7 out of 30, um, which actually indicates pretty significant, significant cognitive dysfunction. Um, and post-lumbar puncture, she had a bit of an improvement. There's also this three meter timed up and go test. That's another test that one can use. Um, and you could see that before her tap test, it took her about 25 seconds uh, to walk three meters um, and post tap test that improved. I also had a video that I was hoping to share. Are you still able to see my screen? Oh. Yeah, I can see the, the slide, but we can't see the video. Um, okay, give me one sec. Now, do you see the video? Okay. So this is a video of an example of the timed up and go test. Um, which is how long it takes someone to get up from the chair, walk three meters, turn around and sit back down. So I'll just play that. So this is before the lumbar puncture or the tap test. And as you can see, it's a bit of a shuffling gait, wide stance, slow turning speed. To speed it up a little bit. And then the next video will be following uh, after shunt surgery, but this could also be after a lumbar puncture. You can see this patient had quite an improvement. And so those are kind of some of the tests that we perform um, when working these patients up. Okay. So given all of these findings, um, it is likely that Miss Mary probably has a diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus given her imaging findings, physical examination, subjective assessment from her family um, and friends. And so we consult, she was consulted to um, our, to uh, a neurosurgeon um, to discuss next steps. And in her instance, the neurosurgeon decided that her next step would be uh, insertion of a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Um, and so this is done at our hospital with many of our neurosurgeons perform these procedures. And then we also have a general surgery team involved for the abdominal portion. And usually it is done laparoscopically. And so Miss Mary had the insertion of a Medtronic Strata um, shunt set to 2.5. Um, that's just one of the types of shunts that we use. So this is just an article that we came across, which really emphasizes the import importance of um, shunt surgery and timing. And in their study, they saw that patients with delayed treatment uh, with shunt surgery had uh, greater than two times increased risk of death. Um, you know, eventually as hydrocephalus progresses over time, it will only become reversible. Uh, it only becomes partially reversible at later stages. And so early diagnosis um, and halting progression of the disease um, is quite important. So following Mary's shunt surgery, um, post-operative management and care always involves uh, imaging. So we start off with a CT of her brain. Um, and as you can see, this is the before um, CT, which Christine showed earlier, and this is the post-operative CT scan on the right. And as you can see, uh, the shunt is extending through the right lateral ventricle. Um, you don't always see an immediate change in ventricular size after surgery. As you can see, they're pretty similar to the pre and post, uh, to the preoperative scan. Um, eventually with time, this uh, probably will change. The other imaging that we do while they're in the hospital, um, given it's a ventricular peritoneal shunt, is we uh, do an abdominal X-ray um, just to make sure that it's in the correct placement within the abdomen with no kinking or discontinuity. And then uh, we also will do a skull X-ray, especially for the programmable shunts. Um, so as you can see on the left, uh, you, you know this is a picture of the shunt and the setting. And on the right, 
um, goes through all the different settings. So Mary's was set to 2.5, um, which is on the far right here. Um, the performance levels are at the top 0 0.5 to 2.5. So higher the performance level, uh, the more pressure and less CSF it's draining. So if you wanted to increase uh, your drainage, you would decrease your performance level. And this is just some other post-operative care nursing consideration. So um, again, nurses uh, and, uh, you know, the end nurse practitioners, doctors, we are checking their head incisions, their abdominal incisions, making sure that their pain is under control. Um, and a big part is assessing for complications. So those would be shunt failure, uh, infection, uh, subdural hemorrhages, uh, which can happen if you're over draining the ventricles. Um, and it's important to do good abdominal exams to assess for ileus or sometimes bowel obstructions. Um, Postoperatively, Mary did not have any of these complications. Her imaging was stable. Her gait, as I mentioned, uh, after the tap test improved um, and it did improve following the shunt surgery. Um, so her gait score was improved. She did show little improvement on her MOCA. Her cognition was still not, um, there were not drastic changes and she had uh, rehab goals. And so she ultimately was sent to inpatient rehab, um, which we have throughout the city. Uh, just some outcomes and complications uh, following um, intervention for hydrocephalus uh, with shunts. This article over 10 years and 99 procedures, um, the complications of rates of death, pretty low, 1%. Uh, infection, 12%, need for revision surgery is 30%, 33%. And we do see quite a few patients coming back um, who need um, revisions of their shunts. Um, and lastly, follow up. So after these patients have their surgeries, we uh, request CT brains to be done within four weeks, um, just to make sure that their imaging is stable and that there are some, hopefully some changes to their ventricular size. And then at our hospital, we actually have a, a movement disorders clinic with a team of neurologists that specialize um, in many neurological conditions, including normal pressure hydrocephalus. It's one of the largest clinics in, of its kind in Canada. And we get um, many, many patients. There's over 9,000 patient visits annually. Um, it's quite a long wait time to be seen three to four years. Um, our post-op assessment, so it's a little bit quicker, six to eight weeks. Um, but yes, that is the end. Do we do questions now, later or? Um, we will do the questions later. Okay. All right. Yeah. Madam Catherine is ready. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Christine and Vanessa for their presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Can we proceed with uh, Madam Dona's presentation? My sincere apologies. I am ha I am having technical difficulties here in Arizona, and I'm not able to pull up. I can try one more time to bring my screen up. I'm wondering if it's something that I don't have in my settings. Can you tell me if you see my slides? No, ma'am. Still no, not. no. I, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to pull it off without trying a couple other things. And I, my sincere apologies. I think you can proceed with your presentation, ma'am, with permission from matron E. You are not able to share the screen? It, it when I go to share screen, you you're not seeing what I'm seeing. So um, I think there's something in my settings that I need to request permission to do something special, and I am very sorry. Um, uh, then you just present it. May I just present it verbally? Yeah, yeah, just present it. Kathy, do you have a copy of my slides that you're able to pull up? No, I do not. Just okay. go ahead and, and talk about it. I think that'll be great. I think that would be fabulous. If, and, and again, my sincere apologies. 
Um, what I wanted to present was a couple case studies. Uh, I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner. We take care of girls and boys in the hospital as well as in the clinic. But I have a lot of experience with NPH in my previous day. So I'm finding this absolutely fascinating and I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, to speak. What I wanted to do is present just a couple case studies and the point as a nurse practitioner, we do educational opportunities uh, and I wanted to find an engaging engaging way to find to have the staff included in these uh, um, opportunities to learn about neuroscience nursing. And we all know that we get a lot of data and we learn a lot of things, but how do you engage the staff uh, in um, applying those things that we learn? And um, this is actually a fun talk. It's fun for me to give. It's fun for them uh, to uh, come to. And we've been invited to um, actually give it in other places as well. So the case studies, the, the point of having the case studies is to have the nurses review their neuroscience skills to um, understand when and how to call for help. And in, the neat thing about this talk is that the nurses are the heroes. So the nurses have made a big difference in these various studies. The first study is a five-year-old little boy um, who had a shunt revision. We can apply this to grownups as well. So bear with me on that aspect uh, of the age difference. Um, Preoperatively, he was a very fragile patient and um, because he was a former premature infant. And his caregiver is a grandmother who is somewhat uh, confused in appearance. And the staff automatically assumed uh, that she was not capable of giving um, good direction to the staff. Uh, afterwards, the young man, and I'm, I'm so sad I don't have the slide to show you, but he was uh, showing signs of increased endocranial pressure. And um, the residents uh, minimized the staff's concern because they automatically assumed that the grandmother uh, was a simple person and not able to give good information. So the nurse, the nurse went ahead and ordered a shunt series and the shunt series showed a, a kinked catheter and the interoperative uh, slide that I would show you shows an incredibly kinked catheter. The sad thing is the little guy was uh, visually impaired preoperatively, but postoperatively he lost most of his vision. But it was the nurse that made a difference. He, he may have died without her intervention. Um, the next case study describes the transition older child to the grown-up unit and the adult Nurses on the floor automatically assume that this developmentally delayed young man was um, just a challenging patient. He was biting, he was um, spitting at people. And I just happened around on the adult floor that day and they asked me to go ahead and discharge him because he was so difficult. Well, it, it turned out that his vital signs demonstrated increased intracranial pressure. Well, of course they've been medicating him because he was confused and, and agitated. And um, I immediately took him back to the intensive care ward and it's opening pressure um, that I was able to obtain after pro um, propofol was 70. So he also uh, could have died if we hadn't um, intervened and I just happened to be there. Um, and I was glad that I was, but the residents too, they had obtained a shunt series and I believe there was a disconnect and his ventricles were larger. So uh, once again, it was a disappointment that the uh, residents didn't follow through. So throughout the lecture, I'm demonstrating that the nurses were the ones that picked up some of the findings and they were the ones that made a difference in these patients' care. The last one just briefly was a four a uh, shunt revision. Uh, she had multiple loculations. Uh, it was an open craniotomy, so they could fenestrate those loculated areas. And they also did uh, an ETV or endoscopic third ventriculostomy. What was interesting is that when the child came back from the operating room, the uh, stopcocks were closed, not only at the bureau trial, but a student nurse who was in the OR closed the stopcocks uh, towards the patient's feet. So when the um, patient was presented to the PICU staff, they all verified that the beer trawl was open, but they didn't check all the stopcocks. To make a long story short, when I rounded in the morning, this usually very chatty child was uh, not responsive. And um, 
I just happened to double check all the stopcocks and found that the foot was closed and everybody gasped. So when we opened the stopcock, the CSF poured out, I immediately closed it again. And this became um, uh, a very interesting teaching case. So first of all, the child never really woke up. She had major strokes and it's most unfortunate, but this became a national uh, review. And I believe it was NIH that mandated um, a certain um, stepwise fashion of how patients are presented when they're uh, transferred from unit to unit, or in this case, from the operating room to the unit. So this became a huge, huge deal. So here I've told you that nurses are the ones at the forefront of finding um, abnormalities and bringing it to uh, the, the teaching staff, uh, to the attending, to the nurse practitioners. And I feel pretty smug about my um, awareness and openness to hear staff's concerns as well as parents. But recently, very recently, we had a young man whose mother was a challenge. I'm sure you see this with spouses and other family members, um, frequent phone calls, lots of little things wrong, and it's just painful to talk to her. The little guy was ready to be discharged, but the um, mom kept saying, oh, there's something wrong. I'm telling you there's something wrong. So we decided to go as a team to round because none of us wanted to talk to mother individually. It was just so painful, so painful for us. So we walked in the room, the vital signs were stable, he was eating, but because of the location of the tumor and where we put the shunt, we went through or near the fornix and there was probably some swelling there. And you may recall that this is where we lay down uh, short-term memory. And this very bright child was just not himself. So we were incredibly humbled that uh, we didn't take the opportunity to uh, listen to this mother as closely as we should have. And that's one of the things that we talk about uh, uh, at the very beginning is what does mother say? What does the spouse say? What does the family say? And then I end my talk reviewing all those important pearls, uh, which includes double checking your equipment, listening to the staff, listening to the family, moms and spouses are always right. And that we double check our exam. And finally call the neurosurgery service anytime uh, and e even though we will be as responsive, we will be responsive uh, to your concerns. We may not always be right. So that's that's my talk. I'm so sorry I didn't have the slides. I was hoping that it would be vi uh, vibrant and engaging for you, but I appreciate having the opportunity to run through it verbally. Thank you so much for your kindness. Thank you, um, Madam Donna. So you could not put up your presentation, I think you made whatever point you wanted to make, you made it very clear. Thank you so much. I appreciate um, your understanding. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, may I now invite uh, Dr. Mohammed Shahidur Rahman and Dr. Kathy uh, to give your comments and suggestions? Well, I'd uh, like to Thank comment. you very much. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, please carry on. Please. Please carry on. Oh, okay. Um, I just want to say that I think this was a great follow-up to the excellent talk that Professor Kawahawa gave earlier. And I think that it's important to, to hear what nurses do. Um, Donna, I loved your case stories about how nurses made a difference and how being attentive to details and uh, communicating with the physicians and the nurses at the bedside are so important to improve patient care. And Pamela, I loved your um, your case study that you give, gave, I think it's important to follow the process all the way through from diagnostic testing to surgery and the post-op care. And then Vanessa and Christine, um, I also enjoyed your case study. And, and uh, I wanted to know about what is, what is your role as uh, an advanced practice nurse? Like, do you, do you all do the TAP test? Um, do you do the gate testing or do the physios do the gate testing? I was just wondering what your role is um, in the diagnostic testing of the patients with NPH. Yeah, so it's a good question. Uh, thanks, Kathy. It really depends on how the patients present. A lot of, not a lot of the times, but um, some cases, a lot of the workup has already been done by 
at, by these patients being referred to the NPH clinic. Um, as I did mention, though, the wait time to be seen is very long. It's about three to four years. And so a lot of patients also come in through our emergency department. And so we do do quite a bit of the testing on the floor, um, like on, on, once patients get admitted um, to our service. Uh, we do a lot of, a lot of the testing. Uh, we ask our physios and occupational therapists to be involved with the tap test. Um, and so I would, I don't know the exact percentage. Um, I don't want to say it's 50, 50, I don't know, but we do see quite a bit of it in our, in our hospital as well. Thank you. Okay. We have uh, one question from the audience uh, that uh, what, uh, what about the advantages and disadvantages of ventricular peritoneal shunt and ventricular atrial shunt? Which one is preferred more? I think Dr. Muhammad can, Muhammad Shahid can ask. Uh, sorry, I could not hear due to some network problem. Can you repeat it, please? Yeah, actually, we have one question uh, in the chat box that did you prefer peritoneal or atrial shunt? So actually, I would like to uh, you to talk on the advantages and disadvantages of both types of shunt and what are the which one is most preferred recently. Okay, thank you very much for asking this question. Actually, uh, nowadays it varies according to the center. In case of uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt, you have to travel through a long way, you see, from head to a tummy. And uh, so it creates some complications because the longer the uh, tract, there are more tons of complications. Like there may be some skin escalation, you see, in case of ventricular peritoneal shunt, many of the times patients uh, are losing their weight due to lack of appetite or vomiting. The nutrition is not good for many patients. So there is chance of infection or aspiration of the skin. And in case of ventricle atrial shunt, you see the trajectory is very small from head to neck, but it uh, requires expertise and also special uh, uh, shunt system. It's not like ventricle peritoneal shunt. Ventricle peritoneal shunt is a bit easier and ventricle uh, atrial shunt requires some special shunt system and you need uh, some exposure actually because uh, in, in our setup, shunt system is not available. So sometimes when there is infection in case of ventricular peritoneal shunt, we do ventricular atrial shunt with the same shunt system, actually, uh, because we don't have the ventricular atrial shunt in our country. So sometimes it works fine. But uh, in Japan, in the center of Professor Yekakato, they are doing all ventricular atrial shunt because they are used to it and uh, um, it's available there. They're expert on it. And also I think there is less chance of infection in case of ventricular atrial shunt. I think you have answered to the question. And then one more question I would like to ask. Uh, if we are doing ventricular peritoneal shunt or a lumbar peritoneal shunt, is there any uh, time lag in initiating fields after the procedure or surgery? Can you not? Uh, ah. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, it it's, it depends on the you know. Uh, in case of lumbar peritoneal shunt, you see, uh, in, there is no chance of a uh, less chance of I mean, cranial complications like EDH. You say I have experience of some patient dying from EDH due to cranial end complication. So the peritoneal end is same for both lumbar peritoneal shunt and also ventricular peritoneal shunt. Whenever the patient has bowel sound, you can give some food. But if the GCS is not good, I mean, if the consciousness level is not good due to some complications from intracanal end, so you have to delay in case of ventricular peritoneal shunt. But in case of lumbar peritoneal shunt, uh, you can give feeding as soon as you have the bowel sound. Thank you. You have answered. I just wanted to maybe add, maybe ask Don a question secondary to that. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for sharing your experience with atrial uh, shunts. Because in at least we're in my setting, we're so used to the peritoneal shunt, and I think only yeah. recently um, we uh, have considered the ventricular pleural shunts. 
which actually is still quite rare within our center, despite being quite a large center. And I wondered, Donna, in in your setting with pediatrics um, in, in Phoenix, do you get a lot of ventricular pleural or ventricular atrial shunts there? Uh, th- that's, th- thank you for asking. Um, with girls and boys, it depends on why they have hydrocephalus. If they're former preemies, they may have um, necrotizing enteral colitis. Um, they have G-tubes. So we do prefer uh, the peritoneal route first for girls and boys. Um, and then we would consider plural uh, lastly and, and probably go to an atrial shunt. And then we have to monitor as they grow, uh, of course. But uh, thank you for that. Peritoneal first, atrial probably second. Uh, we have some kids with plural shunts. Um, but again, our preferred route is the peritoneal route. Thank you for that question. Thank you. I would like to ask one more question. It may seem simple, but I just want to know in case of ongoing infections, which one is the preferred? Ongoing infection or treated infection or something? Anyway, ongoing infection may not be a condition for a shunt. Maybe we have to externalize it. But treated infection or any other intracranial infection, what are the preferred? Yeah, uh, thank you. This is a nice question. For ongoing infection, because shunt is a foreign body, so you have to first uh, control the infection. I mean, you should exercise the shunt and you know you should repeat the CSF study at least for three times to be clear of any infection or feature of infection. But sometimes due to infection, uh, there are some peritoneal cyst, you know, and adhesion. In that case, if you again put the shunt in the peritoneum, uh, there is more chance of complications because there are some cyst or adhesion. The drainage will create some uh, cyst field cavities within the peritoneum. If you have already adhesion or cyst in the peritoneum, it's better to uh, replace it with a ventricular atrial shunt. Madam Shani, I think that's a great question. Like I think, um, you know, like Dr. Mohammed said, it is, I think the answer is it's complicated because a lot of times we admit these patients with shunt failure, secondary to infection, and we have to first um, remove the shunt, the portions of the shunt that is safe to remove. If it's been for a long time, sometimes we sort of take out the distal or some portion of it. Um, but what ends up with, at least in at my center, a lot of times we externalize it, um, whether if, if it's port, like um, just a portion of it, and we'll sort of um, attach it sort of to an ex, um, extra, um, EVD drainage system, or if we take out the whole part, we put in an EVD, and it's within our practice to um, treat the infection first with the EVD in. And then in, in consider uh, internalization of the shunt. And then the choice of a shunt is where it's like, like Dr. Mohammed said, it's, um, it's sort of a complicated surgical decision. But a lot of times we do go back to, at least within my center, like a VP shunt, um, like a peritoneal shunt. Um, in rare cases where there are say, abdominal cysts or abdominal infection, we will consider uh, pleural shunts as well. Okay, thank you. Before going to a uh, concluding session by uh, Ms. Dabora, I would like to invite uh, Professor Yoko Kato. Yes. Sorry. Regarding her comments on this presentation. Yes, it's very nice because uh, I, I, I should do the, all the VA shunt. But we learned uh, from Dr. Takagi, I, maybe I think Dr. Takagi sensei can make some comment. Yeah. I don't know if he is with us now or not. So yeah, Vyashan, what are you trying to say? So the Vyashan is very short. And uh, also, uh, I think uh, the sometimes the patient is uh, many condition uh, uh, it will be failure because of some constipation of the patient. For some elder patient, is uh, sometimes it's uh, uh, 
uh, it could be some of uh, the cause of the failure. So we actually what you use. I think it's uh, uh, very easier comparing with other shunting system. So you, I, 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 you better to try. Thank you very much for a nice presentation and the uh, uh, NPH. Uh, maybe we can have a more patient at a nursing home, I think. So uh, uh, please continue your research and study. Thank you very much. So once, uh, once again, uh, it's a congratulation, excellent talk. Joy Sensei, Kahara Sensei. They, they left, I think. Hi. Okay. Kahara Sensei. Hi. Uh, uh, which shunting system is the best? Uh, I think. Uh, Please okay. uh, I always do V uh, LP shunt, but my impression is VA shunt is. Uh, most reasonable uh, chance system for INPH patient. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, my my recent research uh, indicate. Uh, INPH patient combined spinal disease. So, uh, LP shunt is uh, not uh, useful for a long time. Hmm. Okay. So, can I ask you Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Please. I think Ms. Deborah can, if no more questions, Deborah can conclude the nursing session. Thank you, Dr. Shani. Uh, I think it was a very brilliant uh, nursing perspective given by uh, three clinical nurse practitioners and one clinical nurse educator. I think uh, through these sessions, what I learned from Pamela Madam's session was early, she emphasized on early identification, uh, which helps uh, patients with hydrocephalus. Uh, both Juanisa and Christine, uh, they emphasized on early shunt surgeries, which improves survival in these patients again. And uh, uh, Catherine Madam, uh, she uh, told us how nurses play a major role in assessment both before and after shunt procedures. And um, her points on double checking and actively listening to the caregivers uh, was really uh, important. To me, I always thought hydrocephalus was uh, a clinical manifestation of a major neurological problem, but today, uh, through these sessions, uh, it was really a new thing for me to know that hydrocephalus is in itself a new, uh, an entire entity. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. I think uh, uh, all of us benefited from all the presentations, starting with uh, Professor Kawahara and all the other nurse leaders. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much all the wonderful speakers, very informative presentation. We learned a lot from all these presenters and I hope uh, we will get more and more uh, wonderful presenters in the near future. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Prof. Kato, do you have anything to say before the closing? Just I want to ask uh, Dr. Simon. So... Can you okay. tell something, please, from Congo? Okay, I would like just to congratulate all the presenters mm -hmm. for uh, the wonderful lectures. We are still uh, learning. We are uh, clinical learners. And I think uh, we have to organize such uh, webinars uh, uh, regularly so that we can be uh, on, the, on the level to manage uh, our patient. Thank you. Okay. 
So excellent organization. Thank you very much, Madam Yi. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for all your support. We will meet again uh, next webinar. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.